I, I love that metaphor with the rights of nature because if you see the world map, we're just like putting like these little pins around it. And we are doing acupuncture. We're trying to heal the world because it's suffering. And the only way that we can make this transformation is if we take those points and bring them together. Welcome to The Regeneration Will Be Funded. I'm your host, Matthew Monahan, and in this series, we're having conversations about regenerative finance, technology, and our living planet. How can we build an economy that's in service to life? Brought to you by Ma Earth. You can find all of our conversations at maearth.com. Thanks for joining us. Today's conversation is with Natalia Green. She is the global coordinator for the Global Alliance for Rights of Nature, also known as GARN, which is a network of individuals and organizations committed to getting the rights of nature recognized. Natalia is from Ecuador, and she got her professional start by working on getting rights of nature recognized in the Constitution of Ecuador, making it the first country in the world to do so. In this discussion, Natalia reflects on the movement over that 15-year period and what are the key challenges and opportunities ahead. I really enjoyed Natalia's contagious energy and crisp articulations. This was one of my favorite discussions at New York Climate Week. Let's dive right in with Natalia Green. Today we're here with Natalia Green. Natalia is the global coordinator of the Global Alliance for Rights of Nature, commonly referred to as GARN. Thank you so much, Natty, for being here. Thank you, Matthew. It's, my, it's a pleasure. It's an honor to be here with you. Mm. How's your New York Climate Week going so far? Oh, it's going really well. Very busy. Mm. But we have been able to bring the, the, the idea of the rights of nature into Climate Week uh, in a very important way. I think it's really important because we, with the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature and with the concept of the rights of nature, we're really pushing towards a new paradigm. And what we need during the climate talks, either at the UN or during Climate Week, is to understand that we need a systemic change. And that's what Rise of Nature is bringing to the platform, a new paradigm where we are like rebalancing our relationship with nature. We are presenting the need for that. Mm -hmm. And we, I'm really, really happy to be coming from Ecuador because we are presenting not only an idea, but something that is working. Mm -hmm. And it's working in, the, in many countries in the world. So it's, it's been fantastic, very busy with presenting it in, at many forums, uh, but definitely a great opportunity to connect with the, the world movement that is definitely understanding the urgency of the mm -hmm. climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And what have been some of the examples or expressions of that work here at Climate Week? Of what are we bringing to the surface around the movement? Well, we've participated in, in some spaces. We were at the march on Sunday. We were we organized a film screening about Ecuador and like talk with like indigenous partners from especially from from the US. Uh, on, on Monday at the Spurs Club, we've been also been doing some other uh, uh, forums. We're going to be working and presenting a forum today at NYU, uh, talking with various leaders. The idea is to present this a variety of, of voices from all over the world. So we'll be having people from Ecuador, people from uh, uh, South Africa, people from the US, people from uh, Europe, and really showing uh, the, the, the broad uh, spectrum of what can be done with the rights of nature. Right now, at this point, we have 35 countries that so have somehow recognized the rights of nature. Mm. Ecuador is the only country that has done it in uh, at the constitutional level. So that's quite amazing because we've been able to change the maximum law. And with that and through that, 15 years later, because 2023 is like that we're celebrating the 15 year anniversary of the rights of nature, we can see some amazing results. But we have countries that have been able to pass national laws. 
So we had the Panama government, for example, here, they were with us on Monday. They passed a national law. Bolivia did it too. We have many cities, that, uh, countries and cities that have passed ordin uh, ordinances or city, city laws, like Mexico, uh, some cities in, in, in Brazil. But we have amazing and beautiful uh, examples of ecosystems being granted rights, mm -hmm. like the example of New Zealand, India, Bangladesh, Colombia, uh, the Mar Menor in Spain. Mm -hmm. There are the and and here in the U.S. there are more than 100 communities that have passed rights of nature ordinances. So this is happening <laughs> all over the world, mm -hmm. and we are bringing those examples and saying, look, it's. We cannot keep on saying that nature is an object that you exploit because nature is a subject that you protect. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be reflected in the legal system. So we can also change how people view nature and change the relationship with nature. So that's what we've been like trying to, to show uh, here in during Climate Week in the US and demonstrating that this is a concept that can really infiltrate all the movements and should because this is an idea that what we're doing with GARN is really articulating, putting all the, the pieces together and people uh, allowing people to connect. However, it's an idea that should be part of absolutely every movement and every person that is speaking during Climate Week. Right, right. Yeah, people love to pay lip service to system change and transformation, and we need to be doing more. And here we have a, a living example of something that is a, a real paradigm shift. It's a growing mm -hmm. movement. It's a rising tide. There's examples all over the world, as you said. Um, you've been working in this space for some time. You mentioned it's the 15-year anniversary coming up of the Ecuadorian uh, constitutional recognition of rights mm -hmm. of nature. Take us back to 2008 and where were you and how did you get involved with all of this? Of course, we're actually September 28th is the exact date. So we're very like few days away from, very the, close. The, the, yeah. the, from the celebration. Congratulations. Thank you. And 15 years late, uh, ago, I was involved with the constitutional process. I was working with a uh, Fundación Pachamama with civil society. Um, I was hired actually to do uh, some political follow-up, political uh, uh, incidents of the whole process. And I remember we went to the assembly with 10 proposals, proposals regarding oil and mining and fisheries and, 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 and protected forests and so on. And the 10th one was this idea of the rights of nature. Mm. And at the beginning we arrived with this idea, it was very crazy. We had only heard of it uh, that there was something that Tamakwa Buru had uh, passed an ordinance here in the U.S. Tamakwa Buru is like this very little town. Mm. We had heard about it uh, through Cormac Cullinan's book. Cormac is actually here in New York with us. And uh, Cormac wrote a book in 2006 about a uh, wild law. You know, why hasn't nature been part of the legal systems? Mm -hmm. And we brought that idea to the Constitutional Assembly in 2008. And to be honest, only to bring about a debate on whereas nature is a subject of rights, um, what, what will happen if it was, mm -hmm. and to understand and bring the debate that we are part of nature and that that separation is unreal. Uh, so we were very excited when there was a huge support for this idea. Uh, we organized, I was part of an amazing uh, uh, celebration that we did a day before April 10th, so that was April 9th, 2008, where we brought shamans from all over Ecuador. There were 30 shamans from different nationalities that did a, an, a ceremony, a spiritual ceremony inside the assembly, calling for the spirit of nature so that nature will be there for the vote the next day. And the next day, 94 out of 160 assembly members voted in favor of granting nature rights. Wow. And that was absolutely amazing. And of course, like my work during the, the assembly period was to tell them why we should be doing this, but also convincing some people that were saying, if you do that, you know, what's gonna happen with the economy of the country? Uh, uh, this country is already a poor country. Why do you wanna make it like even more poor? And I remember uh, that something that was a really powerful argument was that the constitution has always been a very Western instrument. 
And in this experience with the constitution, we were trying to make it a more democratic instrument mm. where we were including the voices of all Ecuadorians. There were more than 4,000 proposals given to the constitutional assembly. And this idea of granting rights to in the inherent rights, recognizing the inherent rights of nature was a way to make out that instrument more democratic mm. because it will be including the indigenous worldview into uh, an instrument that was pretty Western. So it was amazing because when we were talking to the indigenous people, we were saying, oh, we're here for the rights of nature. And I remember one, because the idea of the rights of nature doesn't necessarily come from indigenous people. That the worldview and the understanding that nature is our, our mother, of course, does. But that translation mm -hmm. wasn't really like something that came out from Konaye, for example, from the indigenous movement. However, they, of course, like uh, jumped into it immediately. Mm -hmm. Because I remember one uh, indigenous leader saying, "Well, you don't, you guys don't have that yet." Mm. And it was so, it was such an amazing question because it was mm. obvious. <laughs> Nature must have rights, and it was so stupid of us not to have it yet. Uh, so we were able to incorporate it, and of course, the, the indigenous women and many other movements understood it very fast, and and understood that this is a really amazing way of translating a concept that indigenous people have been trying to tell us for a long time and mm. we have not been listening. And it's the idea that we are part of nature, that nature is our mother, and of course she needs to be respected and considered into law. So I was there doing this whole process, convincing and talking to assembly members, uh, and we were organizing like uh, these like, gatherings so they would like, learn about it, and of course like celebrating once uh, this passed in, uh, in April 10th. April 10th, uh, I remember it very clearly, uh, Article 10 passed and it said uh, that the, the, the Constitution passed, it recognized the rights of, of people, of corporations, but it also recognized the rights of nature. It said that it will, rec it will give rights to nature that will, be, that will be developed later. So that Article 10 is the one that really moved forward because it, it made that big, huge lift, that huge step of recognizing that nature is indeed a subject of rights. Mm. So after that, I didn't have any other option than to devote my last 15 years to the rights of nature and really develop and continue working on the implementation of the rights of nature in Ecuador. But in 2010, we went to Bolivia. Um, there was the Cochamama Convention for the Rights of, of, of Mother Earth and Climate Change and Indigenous People. And out of there, uh, there was the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. And we met amazing people from all over the world, realized that Ecuadorians were not so crazy. We, have cra we had crazy people in Australia, in South Africa, in the US, in Europe, everywhere, not only South America. And that same year, and this was April 2010, in September 2010, we gathered in Ecuador and created the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. Mm. So. And how has that, how has GARN evolved since then? And can you tell us more about the organization? Yes, of course. In 2010, we, uh, I remember because we even created the website and it's, uh, we quoted Victor Hugo and it said, uh, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And we were wrong. It wasn't its time in 2010, mm. uh, but we wanted it to be, it, but it wasn't its time. We were just like doing this in Ecuador. It was very hard the first years. Actually, the reason why Ecuador started speaking about it is because even in Cochabamba, Evo Morales was talking about the rights of Mother Earth and Ecuador very gently like raised their hands saying like, we have it in the constitution, you know, because they were passing the laws for mining and everything. They didn't want that to uh -huh. be, to have teeth, you uh -huh. know, and to be applied. Um, so it was very early. And I feel we've been, the first years, of course, we were working voluntarily with, with Garn, like with an amazing group of people really promoting this idea. And I feel that we were pushing a ball over a hill, mm -hmm. a really heavy ball over the hill, mm -hmm. convincing people about the rights of nature. Remember I came to the US, maybe it was like 2012 or something, and we had Fox News saying, can you believe these hippies? They, they say that nature has a, the right to exist. And I was like, if nature doesn't exist, how could you? <laughs> you know, it was, it's so obvious when you think about it, mm -hmm. but it's still questioned in some places in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had been pushing this ball, this heavy ball, and I feel that we have reached the tipping point, the, the top of the mountain, and that ball has started rolling. 
And what we are aiming to do as a garden right now is to become bigger and stronger. So we don't, so we can accompany that ball. We don't own the ball. Mm -hmm. You know, the ball is this huge, amazing movement. But we want to make sure that if there's like a little stone right there, we take it apart and that we like trim, you know, like everything so that huge, amazing movement can roll. Mm -hmm. But we have just like, we're just reaching that point where this movement is, is, is growing so much. We have Antonio Gutierrez saying that uh, the Earth jurisprudence movement is the fastest growing movement in the world right now. Mm -hmm. So our role as Garn is pretty much to accompany that movement and to bring it together. Uh, I think that articulation and coordination is the most important thing that we can do right now mm -hmm. because there are so many things happening that the idea is to connect the people and, and say, okay, you want to change your law, your constitution, your ordinance, look at what Colombia did, what we did in Ecuador, what happened in New Zealand. You know, mm -hmm. like there are so many beautiful examples that the idea is to connect the people and connect the experiences. So we have now created nine hubs a regional and thematic hubs. So we regional, we have North America, Latin America, Africa, Europe, Asia, and the Pacific. And we have a thematic hubs, a youth have an academic have a legal have an indigenous council, a, where people with similar interests a, come together. So in France, they, under the, the umbrella of, the, of Europe, they have a réseau francophone. They come together and speak in French to, you know, promote initiatives in France mm -hmm. for the rights of nature. And uh, what has happened is a really amazing phenomena of bringing people together with uh, similar interests. Our academic hub just launched an eco-jurisprudence monitor in which you can see the whole world and you can see all these experiences because I'm, I'm mentioning 35 countries with legal uh, with, uh, with legislation that has passed, but there are more that have projects that are ongoing. So in this map, you can see like all the ordinances, you can download the documents, you can see like everything that has happened and see how this world is getting acupuncture. I, I love that metaphor with the rights of nature because if you see the world map, we're just like putting like these little pins around it. And we are doing acupuncture to a really, uh, we're trying to heal the world because it's suffering. And the only way that we can make this transformation is if we take those points and bring them together and figure out and have them realize that there's a strong voice and there's like this strength that can really make things happen. So that's the role of Garn. That's what we have been doing now. We have a 6,000 members around the world. 600 of them are organizations. A all over the, the world, uh, we have an executive committee with representations of all the continents. And it's, it's quite amazing because, uh, as I was saying, this has been a dream for the past 15 years and it's finally happening. Mm -hmm. So Ecuador passed recognition of rights of nature at a constitutional level, but a lot of the movement you're describing is also happening in local contexts around specific bodies of nature, mm -hmm. um, different ways of recognizing personhood. Um, so can you share more about kind of that spectrum? You know, it's a powerful, uh, simple idea, but the way that it's expressing and manifesting is obviously has a plurality of approaches in this ecocentric law or earth jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. Well, Ecuador was able to pass in this constitution because we had a very specific scenario. We were changing governments. Uh, we had just been like uh, dollarized. Uh, we had passed like uh, a decade of like a lot of like political instability. People were ready for a change in Ecuador. We were starting with the Yasuni ITT initiative to keep fossil fuels on the ground. Uh, understanding that we also had the worst case of oil ex exploitation in Ecuador in the world, in the Amazon, there was the Texaco oil spill and like everything that happened around Texaco in that case. So in that moment, mm -hmm. you know, it was really like the perfect storm to bring the rights of nature. But we understand that that's not the situation for most of the countries in the world. I don't think that we can ever, or hopefully, let's see, but maybe like dream about changing the constitution of the U.S. However, People in the U.S. have been uh, able to change local ordinances and stop, for example, fracking from developing in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania through a local ordinance that recognizes the rights of nature. So what I like about this spectrum that we're talking about, the rights of nature, is that it can be 
first, we need to be very creative, mm. but it can be applied to any sort of experience and any context. So if you're changing your constitution, like Chile was two years ago, we were there, they had amazing language. I'm really sorry that this got immersed in like the uh, uh, rejection to a new constitution that was like very political. It wasn't anything about, about the rights of nature, but it would have been amazing to have it in Chile. Mm. But there are few countries that changed their constitution. Uh, we have the, the experience now of Aruba that is amending its constitution and it wants to include it is already the proposal is already in parliament and if Aruba changes its constitution it's a path to enter the Netherlands so that's quite uh, powerful but then you have countries like Bolivia that was able to include the universal declaration for the rights of mother earth as a law they have a law for mother earth so they have a national law uh, Panama just passed a law to recognize the rights of nature in the, at a for the whole country but it's a law still uh, and those I, I see it as stages, you know, so Ecuador has it as national. You also have these like uh, national laws like Panama and Bolivia. But then you have uh, cities, cities in Mexico, Oaxaca, uh, Mexico City, Colima. There are four cities that have rights of nature and the idea is how to implement that. Of course, it's not as strong as having in the Constitution and you need like a really empowered global a movement a civil society to make it happen you know mm -hmm. i feel it's like a ball and you can have the the law you can have the principles but if you don't have civil society doing it it's like having a you know a, a painting that mm -hmm. you want to hang on your wall but you need to actually hammer. have someone with a hammer mm. putting up a, a wall. You know, mm -hmm. that's what's important. What's, that's civil society. And that's the reason why we're doing this as a garden is to mobilize civil society, to get the hammer and put it on the wall. You mm. know, not only have legislation, but actually make it happen. Uh, so that is happening in, in places like, like Colombia, but uh, like in, in Mexico. But I really like the approach of the ecosystem approach uh, because that is easier to pass. Uh, what happened in New Zealand uh, with the Wanganui River, with the Teruraka, is a, a powerful because it raises a model of governance with nature, mm -hmm. where you get the guardians of nature uh, responding on behalf of nature, but nature is the main protagonist. Mm -hmm. um, the same with Bangladesh. All rivers of Bangladesh have been granted rights. In Colombia, you have 22 cases. Most of them are rivers that have been granted rights like the Atato River. But you also have cases like the Amazon where the judge ruled in favor of the Amazon as a subject of rights, but also for the rights of future generations. Mm -hmm. So you start getting these like amazing combinations that really make a difference. And Mar Menor in, in Europe became the first ecosystem to have rights, uh, legal rights in, in, in Europe. So those wins, those victories are huge. But I want to, to go back to Ecuador and tell you what has been, yeah. how have we seen it? Because in 15 years, we've been able to have some cases, some have some defeats, especially politically. Uh, when we started this, President Correa didn't like it, although it was during uh, his mandate that the constitution changed. But he didn't like the idea of the rights of nature. And he really promoted a big mining uh, development in Ecuador, like the, the horrible uh, Condor Mirador mine that has developed that is the only open pit mine in Ecuador right now. Uh, however, at the same time, like 15 years later, we in Ecuador, I work with an organization called Sedenma, have a, a, a juridical observatory for the rights of nature. And we have 65 cases of rights of nature implementation. Most of them are successful cases. Mm where you, we've got Los Cedros, it was a protected forest. In Ecuadorian legislation, a protected forest, uh, you cannot do cattling and you cannot do agriculture, but you can do mining, which is terrible. And uh, we, the, the constitutional court selected that case and the judge Agustin Grijalva listened to 75 amicus curiae. Almost 40 of them were from our side getting scientists uh, talking on behalf of the howler monkey, of the spider monkey, of the orchid, of the frog, of like of the river, of w wow. the water, of everything, and giving him enough information and evidence that is different from a case of like environmental law. Mm -hmm. So he can sustain why the natural cycles of los cedros were threatened. And he ruled in favor of prohibiting mining in los cedros. So that was a huge win. 
this January, uh, we have been going to court for two years uh, on behalf of two frogs. The Atelopus rojilostris y Coete Confusa, two frogs. One of them was renamed and it's now Rana de la Resistencia, resistance frog. Actually, DiCaprio helped us with that because he was tweeting for a campaign to change the, the name. Always getting famous people on board is, is, is definitely good for, for, for media and to call attention. So it's, it was wonderful. And these two frogs uh, won and uh, revoked a, a license of Codelco, that is the second world largest mining copper mining company in the world from Chile, that wanted to mine in the cloud forest in Ecuador. And because these species that were considered extinct, they were not considered in the environmental impact study, although they were uh, rediscovered, we were able to take them to court mm. and they won the case. Mm. So having having rights of nature at the constitutional level, you know, it's it's important, It's but it's in a document and it relies on civil society and enforcement and culture and the people to uphold it. What you're saying is that it's then provided real tangible teeth to then bring cases and you know resistance to mining in forests, for example, and to win in in many examples. Mm -hmm. And um, are there other advantages that you've seen having that you know constitutional north star mm -hmm. rights of nature recognition uh, affording mm -hmm. the country? Well, definitely have it in the constitution. We have a powerful, extremely powerful tool. Mm -hmm. So strategic litigation is key and we are winning cases that are amazing to have this paradigm shift we were talking about mm -hmm. because we are winning the cases and we're saying, look, it doesn't matter if you have, a, have an environmental impact study uh, presented. It doesn't matter if you want to comply with it. If you are putting a species in risk of extinction, mm -hmm. Article 73 is telling you that that needs to be stopped. Right. You know, so it's definitely giving teeth and enforcing what's in the constitution. But I want to talk about something that for me is even bigger mm. than winning those cases. Uh, the rights of nature movement, I feel is very similar to other civil rights movements. You know, uh, when we were able to grant rights to women and, uh, you know, uh, pretty much get rid of slavery, slaveryism. All of those movements that change and, and advance the rights, really change the system and a, especially the imaginary of the people, change society. Mm -hmm. So what I like the most about Ecuador is that 15 years later, you have, for example, a 20 year old that is just like starting to study law is in his second year of law. And he's not questioning if nature should have rights. Right. He has it. He has, he understood that nature has inherent rights mm -hmm. and maybe we need to apply, like have like better ways of guaranteeing those rights, applying those rights, but nature has rights. So what has changed is society. So it's like, you know, getting a uh, devolution of slaveryism. We are uh, understanding that nature is not our slave. That nature is not an object, is a subject. And with that change, you know, People need to change. So uh, in the U.S., for example, you have not been able to get rid of uh, racism, but it's illegal. And more and more, like the younger so a, a generation understand that there shouldn't be anything such as racism, that, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with the rights of nature. When you include and change the legislation, you start changing the imaginary, you start changing society. Mm -hmm. And you say, of course, nature has rights. Of, na of course, nature is alive. Of course, we are part of nature. That, and if it's in the law, I have to comply with it. And it starts changing the people. So right now in Ecuador, we have all social movements, indigenous movements, like the uh, agroecology movement, like all movements in Ecuador incorporate the rights of nature because uh, it's strengthening their fight but because it makes sense and they're not questioning anymore. Mm -hmm. So I feel that the win that we had a, a month ago in Ecuador, a win that is very uh, close to my heart. I've been working with the Yasuni since 2006. So I've been like 18 years working with Yasuni. I worked with the ITT initiative. That's how I got involved with the, with the rights of nature. I worked in like all the initiatives and like after uh, President Correa said, we're not, we're going to eliminate the initiative. We're going to start drilling. Uh, we became part of Yasunidos. We gathered 755,000 signatures 
to leave the oil on the ground. And there was a fraud that was not considered. Uh, and 10 years later, after a big fight, finally the, the, the electoral tribunal and the constitutional court uh, agreed that we should have a consultation. And in August 20th, 59% of the country voted in favor of leaving the oil in the ground in the ITT block. Mm -hmm. So that amazing win, like I wish that we had done it like 10 years before and there wasn't any exploitation in the ITT that is such a biodiverse place with non-contact indigenous people and so on. But that win really represents a change in society. I think that now we were ready. We are ready because we know that nature has rights. Mm -hmm. That same day we voted in favor of a prohibiting mining in Quito, in like in four scales of mining. And now 69%, it was even higher, of the population of Quito prohibited a metal mining in the Choco Andino. That is an amazing, really amazing biodiverse and unique zone in, in Ecuador. The last uh, clean, for, uh, clean rivers and forests of the city. Mm -hmm. And those changes, having 69% of the population giving you that message is very strong. And I feel it's it's a result of having 15 years of rights to nature in the constitution. We've changed society. So that's what's amazing to me. And uh, that is what I feel is a change because victories in, in, in court can happen. And mm -hmm. that's, they, they drive us and they, they energize us. Yeah. However, it's the change in society that is what we need. Yeah. And part of that change in society you alluded to is with the, the next generation and the younger people coming up. And you, you mentioned the hubs that Garn has mm -hmm. and one of those hubs being a youth hub. Can you share more about how you think about the next generation, how you orient your work and um, yeah, what, what's giving you motivation mm -hmm. and hope in that respect? Of course. So the youth hub is a beautiful initiative because a uh, there are youth ambassadors from all over the world that come together to learn about the rights of nature. So they have a book club where they like read about the rights of nature, but not only read about it, they meet author, the author, they meet Cormac, they meet Vandana Shiva, they've been, mm. because they're all part of our movement. So they get to meet these amazing leaders that are writing this, uh, this content about the rights of nature. But it also connects youth. Youth is really powerful. Youth can really make a difference. And uh, connecting them and uh, including the idea of the rights of nature is really powerful. We've had cases, as I was saying, uh, in, 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 for the Amazon where youth also went to court and they won in favor of the rights for future generations. In Ecuador, we have a case for gas flaring uh, when nine girls went to court on behalf of the rights of nature and because of climate change and said, stop the gas flaring. Mm. We need to like, you know, that needs to stop. They need to turn off the, the gas flaring. And those nine women had either themselves or someone in their family, they all had cancer because they were in the Amazon, like breeding this. So the strength of, you know, combining indigenous rights, women rights, Get rights for the future generations and uh, rights of nature is extremely powerful mm -hmm. because, you know, we, we are doing this together and we're doing this for our future generations. And what I love about it is, uh, as I was telling you, we won this case for Intech and uh, we won it on behalf of the, of the frogs as well. And my little kids, I was mentioning that I have an eight-year-old and a five-year-old, they were saying, we won, mommy. The frogs won, we won. And for them, there's no difference. You know, we sometimes raise our kids and have them uh, thought out of this understanding that nature is alive and, and, uh, and that, that nature has rights. If, if a kid goes into a room and there's like uh, an animal, they'll go and talk to the animal as if they're talking to you. They'll like pet him and talk to like the animal as it was a, it was a person. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, then, then you go to law school and law school 101 tells you like a, all, nature is an object. Yeah, property. <laughs> Co property and corporations have rights, but nature doesn't, you know. Right. So you get like taught out of it. But naturally, mm -hmm. we know that we are part of nature and kids know that they're part of nature. That's how like my kids were celebrating when we won for the frogs and the frogs won. It was the same thing. They had won. So the power of future generations, the power of having a youth hub and getting them together and saying like, and, 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 taught, and teaching kids about the rights of nature is extremely powerful. So 
that that's the idea and if we can get more kids and like you we've seen now in climate the climate uh, march all the youth that was there you know we we brought these huge balls with the world and like all the countries that have rights of nature and having the kids play with it was amazing that's what we want you know because this is we need to have that energy that joy that hope the things that are happening can happen differently i think that we cannot bring about a, a new society saying that we're doomed mm-hmm. you know you're you don't have a future that i believe that as as a, as humanity we've made mistakes but we are not an evil species <laughs> we can change things around yeah. hopefully fast i don't think that we're doing it fast enough and that's why we mm-hmm. are rushing that's why i cannot relax here because yeah. I, we need to rush things and we need mm. to get more people into this idea not only the rights of nature but and uh, the urgency that we need to change how we view nature and limit ourselves the great thing about na- rights of nature is that when you balance rights my rights stop when your rights start and my rights will stop when nature rights start so if you start putting nature into the table and you know and understanding what will happen to nature if there's a, this project and so on then we will take very different decisions to what we're doing right now right i remember when i first learned about rights of nature it was at bioneers conference many years ago and it was such a fringe idea you know it was cited that ecuador was the first and bringing it in i mean this was probably I don't know, a decade ago. I was maybe there because I was in Pioneers. I think actually now that I realize, yeah, it was probably you on stage <laughs> a- a- educating us. And and yeah, and Pioneers has has Is elevated it? the movement so beautifully for so so many years, but it it's been watching it go from, you know, very fringe radical um the common pushback of oh it's not going to be effective it's too wishy-washy yeah. or, or or like you know too scary because it it brings up all kinds of unknowns and does this you know really just turn over all of the the current notions of property rights and so forth and 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 as we've gone we've seen that like this this has tangible positive benefits there's mm-hmm. a lot of different ways that it can be implemented it's an idea whose time has come it's spreading courts are starting to recognize it professors are bringing it into their law school programs you yeah. know it's it's movement um and it feels to me and i'm curious what you think but it feels to me like this this notion of rights of future generations is kind of what it felt like 10 years ago with rights of nature where now you're starting to hear rights of future mm-hmm. generations it's still fragile it's still kind of a new um idea in our current westernized mm-hmm. eurocentric legal paradigm yeah. um yeah what's your take i think it is new for many people but um when we were talking with the indigenous movement and they were cautious about the idea of rights of nature mm-hmm. they were like oh but is this going to affect our collective rights are going are you going to go on behalf of of our ecosystems the ecosystems that we are protecting to court and like what's our going to be our role i think that's the same discussion that we can have for like the rights of future generations mm. they are completely complementary right and we cannot do like we can and actually that it has not happened we cannot go on behalf of to court on behalf of a, a forest where indigenous people live without those indigenous people that w- that is not happening in ecuador mm. we go on behalf of the forest with its guardians to mm-hmm. court mm-hmm. and it's complementary and in most of the cases of the 65 cases that i told you we have in ecuador right now we have won either for the rights of nature or for the lack of consultation so the violation of indigenous rights mm-hmm. but the combination of them makes it so powerful so like if you add an additional component to this that is the rights of future generations it will make the cases even stronger mm-hmm. uh, so i feel that yes it's sort of like the new kid in town but uh, it's not going to be hard to incorporate them because mm-hmm. we're talking about the same thing right. right but having children go to court on behalf of their rights is exactly. quite powerful exactly because it elevates the importance of the voice of our current youth yeah to help speak on behalf of future generations which yeah i mean it just gives me chills to think that we can now really bring those voices tangibly into all of these different cases and contexts yeah no oh, definitely it it makes it stronger and that's why i see that you know this big ball gets 
like feed <laughs> fed with, for, with, for, with many voices and mm -hmm. many, many, many fights and many resistance. Yeah. Uh, what needs to happen too right now, I feel that the social movements have caught it quickly. And yes, it's harder to organize a youth because they're young and not all of them can, you know, yeah. come to New York. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But I feel that uh, they are feeling the urgency and they don't, they want to have hope. Mm -hmm. So, uh, In Ecuador, we had 60% of our voters are uh, under 40. So they are the ones making the decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, that's 59% that voted in favor of Yasuni and that the 69% that voted in favor of, of, of Quito. Most of them are young people that when we have like the older generations saying like coming with all the economic arguments of how much money we're going to lose and so on, they're saying, we don't care. Mm. You know, first of all, that money is not coming to us. But second, because like even like the exploitation of the ATT, most of it was going to the Chinese companies that were doing the perforation. So it wasn't even coming to Ecuador. But other than that economic uh, discourse, they were saying it's not worth it. Right. You know, like money is not hasn't done anything for us and you are getting rid of our future. Mm. So they didn't they didn't question it. Yeah. They just voted in favor of nature, mm. in favor of life. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's like the power of, of youth, you know, that they, we cannot bring about like this new generation without hope. And it's, it's a moment where we could be hopeless. I actually have a master's degree on climate change and I read and read and read about climate change. Uh, I just read an article of Stephen that is called Hot House Earth, that if we reach the 1.5 degrees, it'll trigger all these different drivers mm -hmm. that will make the temperature go up whether we like it or not because it's going to melt the per the, per the permafrost is going to there are so many other drivers mm -hmm. that we are triggering with this like a a rise in the of the temperature that how can we keep on doing what we're doing and why haven't we stopped fossil fuels why Aren't like governments, including in like the Paris Agreement and all these treaties, they that even the words of like carbon and oil, you know, we know what's the problem. It's very clear. Mm -hmm. So what are we waiting for? Mm -hmm. So this, all of these things, climate change and like the fight for climate change and to leave fossil fuels in the ground, all of it is very connected. Uh, but we are running out of time, and this idea of the rights of nature is really pushing because if we are We have oil spills in the Amazon. Uh, first of all, the idea will be to stop them, to leave the fossil fuels in the ground like we did with Block 43. But if there's an oil spill, it's not only an issue of like clearing it up like they used to do, just like on top. You know, all the hard metals go to the bottom and they pollute the water permanently. So rights of nature goes away from the idea of just like a compensation to the territory, to the people who cannot drink the water anymore. It goes away from just like a, a, region, a restoration of the ecosystem, like very superficially. You need to think about integral restoration of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And that's more expensive, mm -hmm. but that's a definite solution to what we're doing. So first, the prevention principle is try to avoid the, 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 the oil spill. But then if something happens, we need integral re uh, restoration. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole different thing for companies. They still don't understand it. But that's the only way that we can achieve, you know, this like, restoration that we need for the, for the, for the world. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a recurring theme. You know, we're shifting from less bad to what is the positive vision. We're shifting from sustainability to regeneration. We're shifting from, you know, stop doing this to actually how are we restoring Uh, the the wealth of natural ecosystems on this mm -hmm. planet. So, uh, outside of the obvious uh, urgency that that we all mm -hmm. feel or or need to feel given the circumstances, what are the key challenges or roadblocks um, for the rights of nature movement specifically? Countries and corporations, if they understand the power of the rights of nature, and they're gonna try to limit it. So here in the U.S., there are like five cases like, like Erie and like many others that have tried to uh, uh, bring about and guarantee the inherent rights of nature and they have lost at the end. Mm -hmm. So you see that there's like a sp important corporate power cor and vested interests that do not want to allow this. So that's like, and, and that of course, 
for the a movement in North America, people are getting disappointed in some sense because this is not working. They're not able to do this in some way. They are changing uh, ordinances that are moving forward. And it, it is a growing movement that is bringing people together. And I know it's going to happen. It's going to happen very soon. Mm -hmm. So definitely like the vested interests uh, that do not want a change. What I was telling you about Ecuador, like having such a, a, a big percentage of the population voting in favor of nature, you will say, well, the, our authorities should know that what what we're voting for, like they should get the message. But then we have the candidates saying, oh, to replace the ITT, we're just going to have to get more minerals. Like you didn't get the message. <laughs> you know, it's, it's it's really obvious. I feel that civil society is a, quite awake, is awakening and is awake. Mm -hmm. But the authorities are still a, a going with the interests of the corporations and, the, and where the big money is coming from. And there's still this idea that we need you know, to develop mm -hmm. and, uh, and the countries of the North need to develop more and the countries in the South need to like catch up with that race. And that's not going to take us anywhere. So we need, that's why rights of nature is not only a part of, of is not only considered on itself, but it's, it's, it goes hand by hand with well-being because we need, it's, it's a whole model of development that needs to change. Right. So we will not be able to achieve when we bid if we don't have the rights of nature and the recognition of plurinationality. So all of those ideas come hand with hand. So I feel that th we do have some, some hope. I feel that people are definitely waking up. Uh, unfortunately, I feel that people are way too connected to technology and they feel that like activism is putting a like in a you know in a publication or something and like a, a social media, and people are not so mobilized. Mm -hmm. They're so mobilized in some countries, but they're still thinking that they might be mobilized from their homes, you know, just putting a like. Right. And I feel that more needs to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to elect better authorities. We need to like go to power. We need to uh, do strategic litigation. We need to go to the streets. We need to go to the UN. For me, the UN is definitely a space that is a, a whole different scenario where we need to go. If we have 35 countries that have some sort of recognition of the rights of nature, then those 35 countries should be a block and promote it, promote the Universal Declaration for the Rights of Mother Earth, promote an uh, uh, international tribunal for the rights of Mother Earth. We have a citizen tribunal for the rights of Mother Earth. We've done that since 2014, but it needs it is a non-binding tribunal. Mm -hmm. So how do we bring about like countries that that have a, a, this platform or tribunals? And the UN is definitely a space to do that. The times of the UN are too slow and people are like running and the UN is walking. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel that those are the, the impediments, the challenges about the speed. I feel that we are going to make it as a, as, a, as a species, I hope. I, I have my hopes up, but I'm not sure that we're doing it a, a fast enough. Right. And, and obviously this requires a lot of funding to influence global policy, to fight cases against very well-funded corporate interests, um, extractive industries, you know, all over the world. How, mm -hmm. how do you fund this work and, and how does that landscape look? So uh, we've been doing this work on a voluntary basis for a long time. We're very fortunate that now we have uh, some donors that have believed in the rights of nature and want to even uh, educate the funding community about this idea because it's a new idea for the funding community as well. Mm. So we have grown, uh, not enough. We are still have like many areas that we need to develop our way. We, we need to fund, you know, like these international spaces. The church, last year we were in, in, in Rome in CNN and, and some of our members went to Rome, they spoke with the Pope and the Pope said, rights of nature, let's work on it together, you know? So if we could add like the faith community, right. you know, into wow. this and with the Laudato Si and so on, is it, it goes, it's, it's an obvious combination, a mm -hmm. partnership. If we could uh, have funding to make sure that we are reaching the faith community, then this could grow much faster. So we do have some funding, this, but this is the first year since uh, 2010 
that I get to be full time at Garn. <laughs> So it's it's growing, but not fast enough. I didn't want to say that. I've, I've heard <laughs> that that this was the first time you actually get a, a salary, and it, yeah, it actually brings a tear to my eye to think how much work you've been doing for so long on a voluntary and part time, you know, kind of paid basis to to support the work. Yeah. Given, yeah, you're fighting on behalf of all of life. Yeah, um, well, it is, but I I definitely don't do this for money. You know, right. it, my driver is like <laughs> it's an it's different and. Uh, it's my passion. That's how I don't feel this work. Mm. You know, I just feel this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. And me and many others, we've like, we have so many other people that are still like not funded and are like still like working for this movement. So yeah. we need to like educate the funding community about this. This is like a urgent mm. need. That's why we want to bring people to Ecuador to come and see firsthand, like talk to the people who won the cases mm. and see how they're changed. Their, their lives have changed thanks to these cases. And are, we, so you're organizing a delegation in that regard? We're organizing a delegation in the March. Uh, so we can bring uh, allies and funders to uh, the Sinangoe territory in the Amazon, to Los Cedros in the Cloud Forest, to mm -hmm. Kimsa in the Highlands, and talk to those people that are winning the cases and mm -hmm. see, you know, how their lives are changing with this. Because Ecuador is a pilot project of what can happen in the whole world. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not perfect. Ecuador is still, we're still fighting even for President Lasso to respect the results of the consultation of Yasuni. So there are a lot of things that we need to do in Ecuador and we're fighting for that. And we are doing, we need to invest in strategic litigation in Ecuador because of like all the potential that we have. Mm -hmm. However, it's definitely like a, a, we are a step ahead of many other countries. So the idea is to bring people, understand what's happening uh, and see how we can grow the movement. As a, and as Garn, the interesting thing in, in Garn is that we are this umbrella, more than an umbrella, I will say, we are this connector. Yeah. I see the rights of nature movement as a, as a big cell. And there are all these cells and we are so like that, that soup around that, those cells, you know, mm -hmm. like bringing them together. Uh, so if there, there's funding, we can, we know who needs it in Latin America, right. in Europe, you know, like for which uh, objective. So this can grow and grow and grow. Right. That's the idea that we can really like fund the movement. Not yeah, the soil is so fertile now. And it's, so it's ready for investment. It's ready, it's for, ready for investment. much bigger funding. And I mean, environmental climate, philanthropic space is already a paltry sum of philanthropic dollars. Um, so, so of course, we're already talking about a fairly small pool of, of funding um, that's currently in the space. And then, of course, you have a tiny, tiny fraction of that going to, yeah. to rights of nature work. Um, mm -hmm. But as if someone's listening from a bigger foundation or from fund, a funding lens where they're starting to get into climate, you know, what else would you say about why this particular aspect of the work should should get at least more attention from a funding perspective? Because I feel that we could not achieve and really target this poly crisis because not only a climate crisis, a poly crisis, mm -hmm. uh, only by working on a uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. What is happening with climate change? And I'm actually really afraid of it. Although like I'm like, I know so much about it. I've like read so much about it that the North wants a transition to clean energy and they're coming again to the South to get their minerals for that transition. Right. And we are suffering from that need of minerals being taken out of our rainforest, of our cloud forests, of those ama amazing pl uh, places in the world because they are justifying, even the companies, the mining companies sometimes talk as the same as, as, a, as a climate activist, that we need an energy transition because they're justifying a, a, a mining because of it. We cannot fight for climate change without biodiversity. That is not possible. We cannot try to solve the climate crisis by ruining and like it, taking our biodiversity to extinction. So that needs to go hand by hand. So if we don't have a holistic approach to the climate crisis, and I feel that that's the most important message to like funders in general, if you don't see the big picture, mm -hmm. we're going to mess it up again. Mm -hmm. And it's going to like finance like renewable energies and it's going to come back to getting the copper and the lithium out of like these amazing ecosystems in Ecuador and Peru and, 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 and Chile and so on. And we're going to make it worse. Mm -hmm. So the rights of nature approach is an approach that we need to change the relationship with nature. 
and nature, like I'm talking about this, this tree, I'm talking about like absolutely everything, not only protected forests. I'm talking about how do we relate to the water, to the Hudson River, to absolutely all ecosystems. There needs to be a limit and a change to our relationship with nature. We cannot keep hitting our slave. Environmental legislation tells you how much you can pollute the water, put this amount of mercury over days, it's illegal. Right. You know, you're telling you, uh, uh, the corporations how much you can hit your slave. Mm -hmm. You're not telling them, do not hit this person because it's not your slave and the slavery is not right. Not It wasn't before and it's not right now for, for nature. So it needs a change of how we relate to nature. And that's like the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And with Rise of Nature, I feel that we are giving that holistic approach on, you know, we, you cannot talk about this thing or talk about fake false solutions. We cannot try to solve the climate crisis with like these like nature-based solutions or a carbon trading <laughs> that is like doing the same thing, the mercantilization, the, the uh, commodification of nature. So let's stop doing what we've been doing wrong and talking about these like false solutions to climate change and look at the big picture. So that's like my biggest concern about that is that there's like a lot of funding going to fight climate change and it's going to kick back on us again, on the Southern countries that are again living so like a second colonization, of course, uh, for the resources. So with Ecuador, I feel that we are trying to promote a different model of development where we're driving away from extractivism. But then it needs, that means that we need to, you know, like a tourism and renewable energies and so on need to be taken in consideration. And renewable energy is not necessarily these huge hydroelectric plants that make, again, a mess, but maybe taking in consideration that we live in the, and you've been there, in the, in the corridor of volcanoes. Why don't we invest in geothermal? You know, how do we make intelligent investment for climate change instead of, you know, just like promoting more mining. Right. right. And that's what I'm like terrified about the, the climate financing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel that there are many other options. If we change, you know, like if we consume less, that we're never going to be able to stop, you know, the pressure that we're feeling for minerals. If we are keep, we keep consuming and I come to New York and it scares me because like, you know, this is like the belly totally. of the beast. <laughs> totally. And we are not going to change that if we don't understand what we're doing to our, ourselves when we're harming nature. Mm. I saw a, an analysis presented by Vibrant Data Labs last night here at Climate Week, and they showed philanthropic capital and private, you know, for-profit capital and different colors. And then they showed these different concentrations of um, renewable energy and ag and social equity and so forth and looking at where the funding is going and overwhelmingly, you know, most of the money is private capital and most of it's going into renewables and this green energy wave, which, you know, there's a lot of merit to and we need, um, but it also just really hit home how few resources are going to some of these other areas. Rights of Nature was not on the map. <laughs> of course not on the map. Math is not on the map, like not even close to being on the map. Right. And it needs to be on the map. Totally. It needs to be on the map. Um, we have, for example, we have like seed funding for all our hubs that it's seed funding of like $8,000. So we offer that. Imagine, it's like, imagine how little money. We offer that to Latin America and our partners presented projects that went up to $60,000. And we had to like you know, they divide that into eight. Mm -hmm. There's a huge need for like projects that are like bringing people into like a, like right to nature tribunals, right to nature cases, right to uh, recognizing the rights of like rivers in Latin America, passing ordinances. Mm -hmm. All of these people are, were saying like, you know, we're doing all of this and we were able to give them such like small amounts of money Yeah. that even though with like with small amounts of money, they did miracles. Like, yeah. We've been able to do amazing thing with like so little money. Uh, if that m movement was funded and where we're aiming is, of course, like we need funding for government, we would need funding for the movement. Mm -hmm. If that movement is funded, then we can make a change. Yeah. And, 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 and the change needs to be very, very keen on this like ecosystemic approach, this like rights of nature approach and what, like, what are the consequences? As I was saying, like, I'm terrified about this uh, rush for minerals because we're living it firsthand. 
And the, the mining companies have exactly the same discourse as the climate activists. And this is really, really scary. Yeah. Well, the money might not be there yet, but I think history is on your side. Life is on your side. Truth is on your side. And, and time will, will play it out. Um, happy 15th anniversary. Congratulations on that milestone. And I know the movement continues and the fight continues. Any final words or messages that you'd like to share, Natty? Well, first of all, thank you, Matthew, for this space. It's beautiful and amazing to have like uh, an honest conversation about what's happening. Uh, I feel that uh, I get energized every morning with the idea of the rights of nature. Every time that I look at my kids' eyes when they wake up in the morning, I feel that if I'm not doing this, I'm betraying the, them somehow. You know, like we need to do this for the future generations. And all the love that I have for them is like what really drives me to be doing, you know, like to be really crying out loud that this is the need, the change that we need. Um, it's, it's necessary. It's proven right. It, we need to change how we, how we act, how we, uh, how we relate to each other and to nature. Nature is the other as well. And I feel that it's definitely an idea whose time has come. And we need to accompany that idea so it goes the right way, the right direction. So I really want to thank you for this space, tell you that, of course, our arms are very wide open to, in the world, but especially in Ecuador, eh, for anybody to come and, and see what we're doing in Ecuador, how we're bringing frogs into, into court, and how this little frog, I'll show you a picture that is amazing, is winning a, a, like this like, huge mining company. You know, it's, it's, it's happening. And that, that should be a reason to give us hope. Natalia Green, thank you so much. Thank you, Matthew. Appreciate it. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I just love the story about the frog. You can learn more at garn.org, where you can support the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. And if you're a funder, let's take notice of just how few resources these organizations and this movement is currently getting, despite its paradigm-shifting impact in the space. You might also like the conversations we did with Grant Wilson from Earth Law Center, Jojo Meta of Stop Ecocide International, Aaron Matariki Carr of Nai Tuhoi and River, my colleague Jan Hania of Biome Trust, as well as Austin Wade Smith from Regen Foundation. All of these conversations and more are available on our YouTube channel as well as maearth.com. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next one. <laughs>